Yeah, well, I, you know, I got into science through veterinary medicine. So I wanted to do medicine when I was a kid. And, and my mum uh, was a big fan of, of medicine. And, um, and so she wanted me to do medicine. I wanted to do human medicine. And I wasn't that enamored of doing human medicine. But I thought it'd be cool, uh, it'd be fun to do it. So I thought I'd start doing, thinking about that. And I was at a boarding school, and my, my housemaster told me that I was reasonably smart, but I wasn't smart enough to do medicine. And, and so I thought, well, I'm definitely going to do it. And then when I got reasonable grades in that, he said, well, actually, you know, if you're really smart, you do veterinary medicine. And so I thought, well, that just sounds like a, that just sounds like a red rag to a bull, so I'm going to have to try and do that. And so I got into science through veterinary medicine. And when I started off, I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be James Herriot because that's where I was from, you know, and that's what you wanted to be. And I lived in that area of the, of, of the UK, and, and so I wanted to be James Herriot and do all, all things for all creatures, great and small. And then I got to vet school and I got fascinated by science. And so I started, I had an option at one point to intercalate and I did a, a, a research project actually on, on herpes virus in, in, in cows, bizarrely. Um, but it didn't matter what the topic was because I was working with this awesome bunch of people who just were enthusiastic about science. And, and my project was terrible, really. I mean, it didn't work well, but it was tremendous fun. And, and in the end, it sort of worked out. But it was just because we all just put our heads down and said, no, we're not going to get beaten by this. We're just going to do it. And it was really fun. So I, I loved it. And then I did the rest of my veterinary course. And, and I applied for a, an internship to, do, to go into to be a real clinician, as it were. And I got a rejection letter. And the day I got a rejection letter, in some surreal moment, I got one of those little ratty pieces of paper in my mailbox saying, hey, PhD available, orthopedics, if you're interested, call me. And I did. And the next day, I had a PhD. And it was as simple as that. I have no understanding what happened, why I did that. I knew I wanted to do research, but I thought I wanted to do clinic, then research. And I went to do research, and I just never looked back. And, it, and I never really regretted it. it. So that's kind of how I got here. And what, what speaks to you about research? Why is it something it's, that you're so passionate about? Well, one of the reasons is the exact antithesis of why I, and so basically the reason why I don't do clinic. For me, clinic, I'm very, I get very impatient with, once I can do something and I can do it reasonably well, I want to move on to the next thing. So I'm driven by that in part. I'm impatient uh, and I'm also incredibly curious and inquisitive and it, it sort of drives me crazy sometimes, but it sort of, ju it does just drive me. So I really want to know the answers. I want to know, I know people are doing things, but I want to know why they're doing things, and why they're not doing something else and does it work? And so to me, it's just curiosity that just, I can't, I can't quench. So my topic was going to be, uh, was changed, but my topic ended up being about, uh, essentially, the potential for using translationally relevant animal models. So historically, like a lot of research, my research has involved the use of, of what we call preclinical animal models. So the animal models, often of, of normal animals, where we use them to test particularly safety of, of devices or biological therapies. But increasingly, um, there is public pressure to be accountable for the use of animals, which is very reasonable. And a realization that a lot of our normal animals, while they are very interesting for giving us information about safety, aren't really very predictive of what happens in patients. And I'm in a very fortunate position because I work within a veterinary school where we have access to uh, and a demand from clinical patients with many of the same diseases that we see in humans. So degenerative conditions particularly, so in the musculoskeletal arena, the areas I work in are infection, osteoarthritis, and bone cancer. And the bone cancer in dogs is very analogous to bone cancer in kids. It's, it's just a little bit more aggressive, but that's what we work on. So I'm actually funded by a human uh, charity in the UK to do bone cancer. We're doing a clinical trial in dogs because dog disease is so, such a good model. And unfortunately, the, the, the number of cases we see is so much greater than the human caseload that we can, we can do discovery much quicker. So you know, that's, that's basically what I end up doing and, it's, and how I'm driven. You know, scientists, have labored under this sort of illusion that we, we just do things on animals and it's sort of convenient and lazy and it's easy and it's not very kind, frankly. And I think the reality is, from my perception, is, is from being within it for 20 years now, is actually that's not what scientists are about. There are some outliers who maybe aren't as, uh, as appropriate as others, but the vast majority of good people trying to do good things in an ethical way. But I think that rather than wait for the public to demand legislation, um, we really need to be taking care of business ourselves. We need to guide ourselves. And so that's a lot of the initiative that I've been involved with through the ORS, the preclinical model section of ORS, through my involvement with AOVET, which is another big group that works in this area, just to try and just challenge scientists to challenge themselves to do the right thing, to do good models, to be sure that the techniques they're using are clinically relevant, are high standards of care, and they're ethical. 
And if we can do that, then I think the public will accept the fact that animals are a regrettable, you know, an unfortunate but necessary part of what we do because they are the most predictive things we've got. And when you say ethical, what does that mean when you drill down that word? Well, for me, it means, honestly, it simplistically means sleeping at night. It means an ability to know. The bottom line is this, and I say this to, 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 to all of my graduate students. When I do a surgical procedure on an animal, it is absolutely undesirable to me to do that. I would far rather not do that. But what I try and do is apply the same approach as I do in the clinic. So for me, surgery can be one of two things. It can be a big bump in the road or it can be a flat bump. And for me, the animal has to go through an experience that's flat and, and as, as painless and as humane as possible. And if I can apply clinical principles of analgesia and anesthesia, do a good job technically, and that means practicing beforehand on cadavers and making sure that when you go to surgery, you do an exemplary job. Aftercare, you do an exemplary job. Then at the end of it, I don't like doing it, but I'm very comfortable that the cost benefit has been appropriate. So for me, that's what it's about. It's about living with myself and the fact that you, know, you, you do this work, which is really undesirable by any metric. I'd rather not be doing it. But until there's really, truly something better, we do a lot of work with computational models, so in silico modeling, so predictive computer models. But all of those predictions come from looking at animals and then converting it back into them. When we've got more of that data, we'll do more of that modeling. We do a lot of cell culture work. But when you do these complex things of interactions in biological systems, particularly when you're dealing with immune systems and, and all of these other things, you unfortunately still need to go into an animal. But it's about designing the right model with the right number of animals so you answer it. And for me, what I always tell sponsors and my students is, we might not get the answer that the sponsor of the study wants but we will get the right answer. So the right answer being that if I do it, or if a colleague in Japan does it, or a colleague, colleague in America does it, it's the right answer. And if we do it well and we get the right answer, we never do it again. That's the best thing we can do, because then we don't waste animals. 10, 15 years ago, that it was very competitive. Um, and I think the realization is that the, the depth of knowledge in individual areas is now so deep that each of us cannot be an expert. I mean, I, I talked to my students about, when I was at vet school, I went into a library, and everything I needed to know was in that one room. Now I go into that room and there's a room off it that's just about bone. And off that there's a room that's got cartilage stuff, it's got tendon stuff, it's, got, it's just exponentially grown. And you can't be an expert in all of it. So to me, I work extensively with engineers and I love it. It challenges, my, you know, it challenges me intellectually, but it also fulfills me because I can do things I could never even think about doing. And so I think we've moved a little bit away from competition. There's still competition, but I think it's much healthier. And the reality is collaboration, if you do it right, means collaborative grants, so everybody wins. Mm -hmm. But you can really leverage the strengths of other people. And you know, the, the first rule of these things is surround yourself with people smarter than you. It, it's, a, it's a winner. It's a winner.